look at this studio because this is where it all began. What do you want people to take away from your music? I want people to get that feeling for music that's like cross between euphoria and despair. If our music is like a soundtrack to people's lives, then like that's the best thing that can, that, that can be. Immediately following the release of Tame Impala's first album, Inner Speaker, the album and the band absolutely blew up. Inner Speaker was nominated for multiple ARIA awards. It won the Australian Album of the Year, and Rolling Stone just named it the Album of the Year. So from this point forward, Tame Impala was on the map. But the album comes from really humble beginnings. It was recorded in a remote beachside house, and Kevin Parker even denied the label's offer to record it in a professional studio, choosing instead to record and produce everything himself with the help of his two best friends, and all of it into an eight track and a 16 track recorder. Both of which, by the way, if you wanted to buy today, would only cost you like a couple hundred dollars each. So let's go over how he did it, what gear he used to do it, and how recording in essentially a living room affected the whole album. So Kevin Parker, who is Tame Impala, by the way, he records, writes, and produces everything himself. He was close to music for his entire life, and he started playing drums when he was 11 years old. He picked up guitar shortly thereafter and immediately started writing and recording his own stuff. At first, he was recording by just using two different tape machines. What he would do is track drums on one, and as it transferred into the other ones, track bass, and continually swap between the two. So he used that up until his dad got him an eight track. And by 2007, Tame Impala had officially been founded, shortly thereafter releasing two different EPs to moderate success. So the success of these two EPs basically greenlit the recording of Inner Speaker, the first album. And so off they went to go record it. Despite the label's offer to record the whole album in a professional studio environment, Kevin apparently just wanted a shack by the beach. And through some mutual contacts, they found a house that fit that bill about four hours outside of Perth, Australia. This house would later be known as the Wave House. This is a quote directly from Kevin. The idea of going to some flash studio where there's some stranger telling you how to arrange your song is pretty absurd to us. You can see how that choice really affected the production of this album, especially the fact that Kevin produced it all himself on his own time. So joined by his his two friends Dominic Semper and Jay Watson, who still play in Tame Impala, by the way. That little group of people, that's really all that was involved in the production side of this album. The house had no internet, no phone service, and apparently it was hard to even keep the electricity on and, and the house would always leak. They even covered the instruments in tarp when not in use. And during a particularly brutal storm, had to hold the door closed. They also recorded all over the space. They recorded in the living room primarily, and they also recorded even like on the balcony. The control room had massive like floor to ceiling windows with the most amazing view. Nothing about this space was properly treated or set up to be kind of acoustically sound. But with a view like that, I would just take the window. This is a fully produced track with guitar, drums, bass, and vocals. Now watch this. I'm going to hit select files. I'm going to hit the track. I'm going to hit upload and then Lao Lao AI is going to automatically separate the instruments from the vocals. This is insane. And this is our sponsor, Lao Lao AI. Here's the vocal. Bottom of the sea. Your eyes. Uh, let's say we wanted drums instead. All I did was hit the drum option and now that's crazy dude. <laughs> I almost feel like there isn't anything I can say that shows you the power of this tool better than just showing you what just happened. Not that long ago, when I was in school, like a year ago, this process was way more complicated than it is now. You used to need Isotope RX, a whole nother program, a whole new set of skills in order to do this. Now with Lao Lao AI, you can just drag and drop. You could use these to sample for a remix. You could use this to learn the part that would have been buried under all of the other parts. If you wanted to do like a cover, you could use this to play along to a cover and separate the actual artist's vocals. Dude, if this was around like five years ago, it would be a whole new world for me. This is insane. So check out the link below if you would like to try it yourself. It is insane. 
Right, okay, the gear. I wanna start off by saying there are probably two kinds of people watching this video. Those who are familiar with the series where we go over famous artists' first albums and how they recorded it on a budget, and Tame Impala fans. And I know Tame Impala fans. You guys are all just like little gear goblins, like little miniature audio engineers and producers, or just full audio engineers and producers. Me too though, so I get it. The reason I say that is I'm gonna focus a lot of this video on gear in the exact exact mixing and production techniques they used because that's what I think the Tame Impala fans want. So I'm going to separate this out into mixing and production gear, drum gear, and then vocals, guitar, and bass. We're going to kind of lump those together. So mixing studio gear first, and it is mainly comprised of the following. The heart of the studio for this album centers around an 8-track recorder and a 16-track recorder. They are the Boss BR-1600, that is the 16-track, and the Boss BR-864. Keep these two pieces pieces of gear in mind. They're going to be important later, especially for the guitars. The studio used two different sets of monitors, the first one being Yamaha NS10s. Those are the smaller ones that you see. And the Technic G920s, which are the larger ones. And I actually know like nothing about these speakers. It was really hard to find info on them. The outboard gear consisted of a Uri 546 dual parametric EQ, a Quad 8 MM403 channel strip, a Roland RE501 chorus echo, and a DBX X165 compressor. Now make a note of that compressor for me. Now, although this next piece of gear wasn't really used until the mixing stage with Dave Fridman, famous for his mixing of the Flaming Lips, the Sure Level Lock. I'm pretty sure that the Sure Level Lock was a major component in the drum tones. In terms of the microphones, the record features a ton of SM57s, Sennheiser MD421s, AKG C451s, and or Sure SM81s. Can't really tell, and it kind of seems like both of those mics were used depending on the footage that you're looking at. And then a Rode K2. Okay, that was a lot of equipment. And if you wanted to see that equipment, you can check out the link in the description. A lot of those are going to be affiliate links though, so uh, if you don't like me, just Google it. <laughs> Hello, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So if you look down at the sub count, of this channel, you'll notice it's actually a, a pretty small channel. These kinds of videos really don't stand a chance against these bigger channels unless people like it and subscribe and comment. And I've been really trying to get better about asking people to do that. So if you happen to be a fan of this content, you think you're gonna watch it again, it really does help a lot, especially when we're trying to compete against channels that are 10 times the size of this one. Thank you. Let's see how this equipment was used on the instruments. Tame Paula is known for some pretty legendary drum tones. And actually some of the techniques used on this record are pretty off kilter and odd. The drums on this record are actually pretty tight, stay central in the mix. They're not overly wide or huge or expansive. Often they were recorded mono, not a stereo overhead. The 60s Ludwig kit was actually mic'd with only four microphones. A quick look at the footage shows a few different options for overheads. Either two small diaphragm condensers set up in an XY pair, or just one small diaphragm condenser, or they would use the Rode K2 as a large diaphragm condenser overhead as well. An SM57 was actually used for the kick drum. That actually provided a bit more attack and less of a hefty thump. And then two different microphones were used for the snare. An MD-421 as the standard snare position pointed towards the center of the head. And then an SM57 placed on the side of the snare pointing towards the middle. That 57 that's miking the side of the snare was probably also getting a lot of hi-hat. And that might be the reason why the overhead was more towards the floor tom than the hi-hat. So let's reintroduce some of those compressors that I asked you to make a note of. Specifically, the DBX-165 and the Shure Level Lock. Kevin loves to add energy to a drum tone through the use of compression. Even if the take is a softer, mild sort of hit, the right compression settings are really gonna make that drum sound huge, up that energy a lot, especially in the high-end information, like the overhead. So those drums, they sound super impactful and punchy, but they're hitting it extremely quietly. But because of the compression, it sounds sounds like they're hitting it a lot harder than they are. That's where you can get some real energy. He's also on record as saying the DBX-165 is his favorite compressor, meaning we can kind of assume that it's the main perpetrator for any kind of production compression going into the 8-track or the 16-track. The level lock, although admittedly it would have been used in the mixing stage with Dave Fridman, that unit forces an input signal to always remain at the same consistent volume. So that means even if you're playing like a really quiet verse and a really loud chorus, it's going to make that average volume the same 
for both. And check out this clip that Reverb did, kind of showing how much energy that adds to a drum take. Just as importantly here, the compression also brought out the room tone a lot more, but we'll wait to discuss that a little bit later. Kevin recorded all of the guitars through a Fender Strat, specifically a deluxe Roadhouse Strat, and all of the bass tones were done through a classic 60s series jazz bass. So for the guitar nerds out there, here is a good approximation of his pedal board. So let's uh, take a moment for the guitarists to absorb and or pause. And then all of this was recorded via SM57s on a Vox AC30. All of these were recorded through those Boss multi-tracks, and the reason they're important is they offered a bunch of presets that could actually change the tone of the guitars. Here's a quote from Kevin. I wanted an organ sound. I had to try and make a guitar sound like an organ. I take the attack off, roll the tone knob off, play with my fingers rather than a pick. I had to do things like that because I didn't own any keyboards or a synthesizers. But I also liked the idea that I could do it without synths, you know? So all of these effects, including the ones on the 8-track recorders, would all contribute to these tones. Of course, some of the psychedelic nature of this album was baked into the concept from the beginning, but this was really emphasized by using all of these effects to artificially create instruments that weren't available to them. Here's another quote for you, and he's referring to the Boss BR-864 for this one. There's a guitar sound that we called Space Guitar. It's a lead sound that sounds like an octave shifted guitar. Very digital and synthetic, but I love that. This was just me messing around with presets and parameters. I didn't even know what they did. So a quick note on the vocal. They were likely all recorded on an MD-421 in the living room, but uh, there's not really any footage of vocals being tracked. So I'm basing this on general footage and general knowledge of what I know about how Kevin records his vocals, but also the live performance of this album that they did in the Wave House uh, with all the same gear, or at least very similar gear. So I want to revisit the Wave House for a second to emphasize how big of a creative role the space had on the production of this album. Your environment that you record in is just as much an instrument as the guitar that's sitting next to your desk, both in the metaphorical sense, but also in the physical sense. Rooms have a fundamental frequency, a tone or a note even, and that kind of makes up the anatomy of the signature reverb within your space. Those compressors, when they're bringing up the energy of those drum tapes, are also going to bring a lot of those room reflections kind of into the fold here. So again, for the fifth time now in this series of video essays, I want to emphasize how this album could not have been made in a professional high-class studio. I'm reminded of that earlier quote that Kevin said about the Flash studio and somebody telling you how to arrange your own song. And you know what? Your living room, your bedroom, they probably sound a lot like that living room in the Wave House. Minus maybe the gorgeous view and the poetic artistic isolation, but those aren't necessary. And your gear, maybe it's not quite this level or maybe it's even higher, but this setup is nothing really to write home about, nothing intrinsically special about it. You could pick up a version of this rig for under a thousand dollars, but what he did with it was nothing less than extraordinary, and that could be you too. So he would later go on to purchase the property in 2020. And actually, if you want to hear how amazing the space sounds, they recorded a whole live taping of the album using a lot of the same gear that we mentioned in this video and that they were using in 2010. So it's definitely worth a watch. And hey, if you like these video essays, give this video a like and a subscribe. It helps it with the algorithm like so much. So really appreciate that. I guess that's all. Catch you in the next one. Bye bye.